Hello class. My name is Dr. Anne Wanjiko Moiro. I am the unit lecturer uh, for the unit uh, we, uh, whose code is BEP 1104 and the unit title is Introduction to Educational Psychology. I take this chance, my dear students, to welcome you to Mount Kenya University uh, in the School of Education and our department is called Educational Psychology and Technology. As a student who is aspiring to be a teacher in future, it will be very difficult for you uh, to be a good and an effective teacher if you do not have the knowledge of educational psychology because psychology is the key to be able to interact with your students uh, in the class, to be able to tell them uh, how they should behave, to be able to identify a student who has got uh, a need and that need requires your attention and without the knowledge of psychology it will be very very difficult for you uh, to be able to assist the student in the best way possible. And that's the reason why uh, we have to learn, it's a core unit in the school, we have to learn introduction to educational psychology. Uh, in this unit, and, and this is our lesson one, we are going to start by looking at the introduction to psychology. There is no way you can understand educational psychology before you understand what is psychology, my dear students. And therefore, in this lesson, we are going to look at at least four things in this area of psychology. The first thing we are going to do is we are going to define the term psychology. After that, we look at the goals of psychology. What do we want to achieve generally in psychology? A, uh, look at a brief history of psychology and we shall uh, be able to finish our lesson by looking at what we refer to as the various uh, branches of psychology. So we start by defining the term psychology. And uh, the term psychology is derived from two Greek words. And the first one is psych. And in the olden days, the word psych meant the soul. So it was a study of the soul. Then logos is a Greek word which, uh, which refers to the study of something, the study of a subject. So we can say in the very early days, uh, during the time of the Greek philosophers, they understood psychology to be the study of the souls, the study of the souls. And by then, psychology was studied as a branch of philosophy. But over time, the definition of psychology has changed such that today we define the term psychology as the systematic scientific study of behaviors and mental processes. In other words, in psychology, it will be difficult for us to be able to know the way you are thinking because psychology is about thinking. We can't know the way you are thinking unless we see the way you are behaving. Because even if you are to open your brain, you are to open your, your mind, the best thing you can be able to see there is gray matter. And gray matter cannot be able to tell us what you are thinking. So we infer you are thinking from the behavior. No wonder the definition is therefore saying that it is the systematic scientific study of behaviors and mental processes. Because behavior is inferred from our thinking, from our cognitive processes. Something else that is very uh, important for us to be able to remember, my dear student, is this, that psychology is not a humanity. Psychology is not an art. No, psychology is a science. It is a scientific, it's the, uh, this field is scientific in that psychologists approach their studies in an orderly, systematic way in order to be able to obtain uh, objective evidence. Uh, for example, when a student misbehaves in your class, 
we are, you always told, avoid judging the, the, the learner, avoid judging the student. Find out the reasons as to why this student is behaving in this way. And if possible, you can even be able to predict that, for example, if a student is in a wrong company, that there is a possibility that in the future, the behavior of this student is, uh, is going to change, not in the positive way many times, but is going to change in the, in the negative way. So we normally say psychology is a science. And what does science, what does science involve? Science, science is about analyzing, science is about correcting data, science is about making inferences, science is about um, predicting what is likely to happen in future. And basically, that is what we do in this field of psychology uh, for us as a teachers and even as we relate uh, to our students or to our runners uh, inside, the, inside the class. Now, uh, we have said that um, psychology is about the behaviors. And when we say behaviors, basically what do we mean? The word behavior, we say it was popularized by a psychologist to refer to as J.B. Watson. And J.B. Watson said that uh, what is behaviors or what are behaviors? They are those of observable actions or responses in both the humans and the, and the animals. That which you can be able to see about a person. The way a person smiles, the way a person um, responds to situations, uh, the way a person even eats, the way a person even sleeps, the, even a general, the general mannerism, the character of a person is what determines the behavior of an individual. On the other hand, when you look at the mental processes, we normally say we cannot be able to observe, as I said from the beginning, you can't be able to observe the mental process in a person. That's why we have to see the way someone is behaving for us to be able to tell how this person is, um, is reacting or is thinking. And therefore we say mental processes, they are not directly observable, but they refer to a wide range of mental processes. Like now, one aspect of mental process is the thinking, the way someone thinks, Mm -hmm. The imagination of a person uh, determines their mental processes, the way someone studies, the way someone dreams, the way someone feels, the emotions, you know, all those are uh, the many aspects, the perception, uh, all those are the many as attitude is an example of uh, the mental processes. And those are some of the things we shall be able to focus later in this unit, which is called Introduction to Education Psychology, so that you can be able to understand greatly about the thinking uh, or the mental processes in our students and be able to know where we come in as teachers and how we ought to, uh, to assist them. So what psychologists do, we say they normally study the overt. Eh? Overt is what we can see, the observable behavior. And at the same time, they also study what is called the covert, uh, the one that we are inferring, the private mental processes that cannot be observed directly or they can't be measured. Uh, but the two now, both the overt and both the covert, they help us to know the way someone is behaving and therefore also the way uh, someone is, uh, is thinking. Uh, proceeding on, uh, we look at uh, the other subheading, which we refer to as the goals of psychology. So what do you have in mind in psychology? What do you want to achieve in psychology? We want to describe, we want to understand and explain behavior, we want to be able to predict, we want to control, and we want to inference. So what you are going to do is that we shall look at each one of them briefly, uh, in a bit of detail so that you can be able to understand when we say describe, when we say explain, when we say predict, basically, uh, what do we mean, my dear students? When we say that the first one is to describe, we normally say that the first goal of psychology is to describe the different ways that organisms behave, the different ways our students behave, because now our students in this case are the organisms, the way they are behaving. Uh -huh. What is the nature of their behavior, you know? Uh -huh. How does it look like? Are these students who are disciplined? Are they misbehaving? Can you be able to, as a teacher, be able to describe the behavior of the students in your class? When you say my class is problematic, can you be able to describe how problematic is this class uh -huh, that you are teaching in, uh, and now where do you come in? Then we also seek to 
understand and be able to explain. Meaning, this is the second goal of psychology, where we try to explain the cause of this behavior. Why does it occur? Why, is, why are you a student? Why are you saying as a teacher that your students are problematic? What happens? Why do they behave the same? Can you be able to give the reasons as to why? Eh? Are they sitting the right way? Is there good ventilation? Uh, have you maybe... Uh, match them together or have you put the bright student apart and the, the, the ones that are struggling on their side, what could be the reasons as to why these students are behaving? Could it be a problem coming from the home? You need to establish the cause as to why maybe your students are, are misbehaving. Then the third goal is the goal of predicting, meaning that uh, how will these students or how will the organism, how will the learners be able to, uh, to behave in certain situations? You can be able to forecast when and under what circumstances this behavior is going to occur. That any time they miss a meal, for example, during lunch break, obvious, you can be able to predict that they'll be unruly in the afternoon. That as a teacher, you'll not be able to teach them effectively when your students are hungry. You can predict that. And that also means that you can try to take measures uh, through which uh, because you already know that's like to happen. Take measures so that you can be able to arrest the situation and be able to help your student. Then, once you know that, then it will be very easy for you the fourth goal, which is to control, yeah, control uh, the behavior. Now that you've already understood the reasons as to why they are misbehaving. And when there is control, then you have the fifth goal. You are likely to change the behavior of people. And as a teacher, we shall change the behavior of our students in a positive way. I have met so many students in my many years of teaching. Students who came to Form 1, for example, who are very ill-behaved, but through our interaction as teachers and showing this um, uh, giving this child attention and so, uh, showing this child that you care, you are really concerned about them, you are able to control their behavior, able to influence their behavior in the positive way. So even as you set yourself, you set foot in the classes, have that uh, idea in mind that as a psychologist, as a teacher who has studied education psychology or who has studied psychology, it is my role as a teacher to be able to influence, to be able to control the behavior of my learners positively because I must have this in mind that all of them are going to contribute to the mini grade of my class whether it is uh, positive or negative. So the, the more they are well behaved, the better for you as a teacher because your work will be easy, they'll be able to score well, and as a teacher you'll be able to achieve what you call uh, self-satisfaction or self-actualization when your students uh, perform well. Then um, briefly, um, uh, we want to go ahead and look at the history of psychology. Where did psychology come from? As I said in the beginning, there was no branch uh, called psychology. The branch that was existing was called philosophy. And most of the psychological aspects were studied under philosophy. They were studied under philosophy. However, there are certain uh, philosophers. For example, people like Aristotle, people like Plato, people like Socrates, who felt that certain aspects of life Certain issues in life could not be explained from a philosophical point of view. Why can, could they not be explained from a philosophical point of view? It is because philosophy is about the universe. Philosophy is about the cosmology, the general universe, uh -huh. understanding the world. Uh -huh. But there are certain aspects in life that philosophy cannot be able to explain. For example... Uh, these people were able to realize that some uh, ideas or some issues in life, like the issue of intelligence, that when we say that uh, in, in, uh, intelligence is inherited from both the mother and the father, that is not an aspect that could be understood from a philosophical point of view. When they say that character, the character of a person, our temperament are inherited from our parents, again, philosophy could not be able to explain about that. Philosophy also could not be able, even uh, even to be able to explain about the, the issue of nature, that, uh, that uh, we are a product of the genes, we are a product of the, uh, the chromosomes that we inherit from our parents. Those aspects could not be explained from the philosophical point of view, including that a child, uh, the way a parent there as a child, the nature contributes to the personality of a child. So there are those aspects that for sure philosophy could not be able to explain. So what happened is this. Some, some philosophers uh, started deviating slowly by slowly from the field of philosophy to concentrate their efforts on psychology. As I've said, the examples of um, Aristotle, the examples of Socrates, the examples of Plato, 
others are people like John Dewey, others are people like John Rock, others like uh, Jean Jackie's Russo, others like people like um, uh, Maria Montessori, and many others. They started uh, drifting slowly from uh, philosophy to start now building a new branch uh, of education, which we refer to as, uh, as psychology. But the person we give the credit for the noble and the good work in developing the field of psychology is no other than a gentleman we refer to as Wilhelm Woodart. Wilhelm Woodart was a lecturer in a university like Mount Kenya. Although that time uh, the lecturer was in a university in Germany, which is called Leipzig in Germany. In the year 1879, he established a lab, I mean, specifically to test psychological aspects, to test things to do with aptitude, to concentrate his effort on research in psychology. And it is through his efforts, eh, and no wonder he is called the father of psychology or the founder of psychology. No wonder it is through his efforts that a new branch came to be born. And this is now the branch we refer to as psychology. But my dear students, it's good that I highlight this, that psychology still does not start on its own, no. Psychology borrows from many fields in life. Psychology will borrow a lot from biology. Mm -hmm. Psychology will borrow a lot from pharmacology. Psychology will borrow a lot from psychiatry. Psychology borrows a lot from ecology and many, many, many other aspects within the environment so that it can be able now to be able to start and be whatever it is, uh, be whatever it is today. So it is good for us uh, to be able to recognize the effort of this man who I have told you was called Wilhelm Udat in the eight, eight, uh, 1879. He was working in this university in Leipzig in Germany, and he said he made psychology an independent discipline. And he established the first formal laboratory for research in psychology, and he also dedicated the first journal uh, to publishing research in psychology. And he is therefore known as the founder, as I've said, or he is known as the father of uh, psychology. And that was in the year 1879. So from 1879, you know, proceeding on, then you see now psychology has stood as a branch of, uh, of its own. And now that takes us now uh, to uh, the other section. And in this section now, we are now going to look at the various branches or what we refer to as the various areas of uh, specialization. So we find that from 1879, up to wherever we are now, 2020, you can see this is over 100 years. It's over 100 years. You realize that now psychology has really grown. It's really grown. And what people now have done is that people have taken up various fields or various specializations in psychology, eh? various specialization. And uh, that is what I would want us to discuss about some, not all of them, uh, because of time. We shall discuss some of these areas. And the first one is the one we refer to as the social, uh, the social psychology. Uh, social psychology, it's about, it's about the study of social interactions. Uh -huh. Issues to do with the stereotypes, things to do with prejudices, things to do with attitudes, things to do with conformity, group behaviors, and aggression. Uh, what happened is that in social psychology, uh, we realize the importance of people interacting with others. My dear student, I would want to tell you this, that by the, the time you are through with this session, with this unit of ours of education psychology, you realize that you shall have influenced me greatly. Uh -huh. because of our interactions. At the same time, I shall also have influenced you greatly because uh, when people are together, they are likely to influence each other. How I pray that my influence will be positive and your influence towards me will also be, will also be positive. Because when people are always together, there is that aspect of influencing, um, the aspect of influencing, uh, influencing each other. I am sure sometimes you wonder, uh, when maybe a, a thief, eh, a criminal has been caught there on the road eh, or along the streets, uh, what happened that um, uh, they start by, by hitting, eh, uh, by uh, the person is, for example, we say in Kiswahili, kuchomataya, what happens is that, remember, it starts with one person. One person will hit the, the, the thief uh, with, a, with a stick. Mm -hmm. Another one will come with a stone and hit the same thief. Uh -huh. Another one will come with a big boulder and hit the thief. 
and the other one will look for a tire, another one will look for paraffin, another one will look for, for, for the matchbox. Why? Because when people are together, they are likely to do what? To charge each other. That is what we refer to as mob psychology. And a lot of the time when there is aggression, there is a lot of influence, a mob influence among the people. And that is what these social psychologists generally are able to, uh, to establish. That when people, are, when people are together, they can either have a positive attitude or they can either have a negative attitude. Someone may come into the group with a lot of energy, but when they see rawness in the others, the others are a roof, there is a lot of apathy, they also like it to, to go down. But I believe that this group of ours, we shall keep our interaction strong and we shall be able to motivate each other positively and uh, we shall eventually uh, be able to succeed and uh, you'll be able to get your owners. The other area we normally, uh, the, the other area, the other branch of psychology, we refer to it as the personality psychology. There's something we say in psychology, it's about uh, the study of personality development, it's about personality change, it's about assessment, and even what we refer to as the abnormal behaviors. We say, my dear student, that we may be here, a hundred of us, or two hundred of us, or even three hundred of us, but believe you me, my dear student, none of us has the same personality with the other. We are all unique. We are all special in our own uh, different ways. And this uniqueness is what this personality psychologists are interested in finding out what contributes to or what causes these things we call individual differences. Uh -huh. Our temperaments are different, especially because of the, the, the chromosomes, the genes that we normally inherit from our, uh, from our parents. And the, the, the people who study personality development or personality psychology, they really want to understand these differences, this uniqueness that are there in people. Some people are introverts and that is their positive. Others are extroverts and that is their positive. But it is very important that all these people be brought together. As a teacher, you must be able to remember in your class, your learners can never be the same. As I said, some learners are social, others are social, but they are all in your class. So as a teacher, you must be able to see what am I going to do as a teacher to be able to balance all my student and that none of these students feel neglected or feel left out uh -huh, so that all of them will be able to benefit from my teaching, from my interaction uh, with them in the class. Then we also have another branch we refer to as developmental psychology and here in the university this branch we normally refer to it as human growth and development. It is one of the units that you're going to study uh, in your first year, first semester. And in human growth and development, what are we interested in? We want to see how a child is conceived uh, in the mother's womb. Mm -hmm. The conception, we look at these, um, the, the zygote, we look at what we refer to as the prenatal development. How does a child grow inside the mother's womb? What challenges are likely to face, like uh, things referred to as the teratogens, the dangers? We look at this child, the birth, which we refer to as the neonate. We refer to, we look at the infancy, we look at the, um, the childhood, we look at the adolescence, we look at the uh, adulthood, and even you look at the old age. So how does a person develop from the time of conception all the way up to uh, old age or uh, what you refer to as late adulthood? Uh, what are the changes that normally take place? And we say in psychology, it's about accepting that I was once a child, now I'm a I'm a mature person, I am an old person, that is the essence, eh? uh, that is the essence of life and it's a very, very, one of the very interesting units and very, very important units uh, for us to be able to understand even how a person grows in terms of their mental aspects, the cognitive, um, uh, the cognitive psychology, uh, how the child grows in that, uh, in that particular aspect. It's also very important for us uh, to be able to understand that. My dear student, we, the other branch we normally study uh, in psychology, it's referred to as experimental psychology. It's another branch, yes. And in experimental psychology, just as you can see, it's about experimenting because we say psychology is a science, about experimentation. We, uh, the people who 
who specialize in this field, they are mainly concerned with things to do with sensations. Yeah. We say someone has got five senses. How do the five senses operate and work? Eh? People even have said there is even a sixth sense, a conscience is the sixth sense or concerns a sixth sense. How do they operate? Uh -huh. Things to do with perception. Yeah. They look at, uh, uh, in life, uh, it's, it's not about... It's not about the way you feel. It's about the actual situation. People may have a very negative perception about something, yet that thing is good. Why do people hold either a positive or a negative a perception? It's about how do you view yourself. If you view yourself as handsome, if you view yourself as beautiful, it doesn't matter what other people perceive about you because it's about what you feel about yourself. Then we, they're also concerned about things to do with the learning. How do the learners learn in class? Uh -huh. The role of the teacher in running, they're also concerned about that. They're also concerned about generally about the human performance, yeah. Because these days now we are talking about performance contracting. Uh, you have really put yourself a target. How well are you able to achieve your target, the human performance and all that? They're also concerned with things to do with the motivation. It will be one of our topics um, that you're going to discuss, even things to do with emotions. Then we have another branch which is referred to as the biological psychology. Uh -huh. Or it is also called psych biology. Yes, it's another branch, uh, one of the newest, one of the new branches, and uh, it involves research on the physical and mental changes that occur during stress. Yeah, like now we are talking about the the issue of the COVID-19. We are all concerned. We are all worried. We are all anxious. You know. So psych uh, biologists are really. Uh, trying to help us be able to cope with these uh, stressful conditions and you know that you shall be able to overcome and uh, life is going to uh, go on, uh, life is going to go on normally. They're also concerned with things to do with running, they're also concerned to do with things to do with emotions, they're even also concerned with our genetic makeup that we are, uh, we resemble our parents. Yeah? Yeah. If, um, if our parents have the dominant gene, we are likely to resemble either our father or our mother. But if the gene maybe was recessive, then we can, uh, we can look like our grandparent uh, depending on the dominant and the recessive gene, which we shall study more uh, in human growth and development. This is also concerned about the process in the brain and the nervous system and how all those interact with the environment and they and eventually influence our behavior. It's another branch, uh, as I've said, of psychology. Another branch of psychology which we shall also be concerned with in class will be this branch which referred to as the cognitive psychology. And cognitive psychology is about the mental processes, how the brain operates, how we process, how we store, and how we retrieve information, and how these cognitive processes influence our behavior. In future, we shall be looking at, uh -huh, uh, in future we shall be looking at um, the, how the brain processes information. That uh, the brain processes information from the uh, uh, sensory, uh, storage, uh -huh, uh, to the short-term memory, to the long-term memory. That is the way the brain operates. And each one of us have something I've said all, all along. We all have something we call the mental index card where similar information is stored together. So this will be part of uh, the aspect I shall be discussing in our subsequent lessons uh, in the class. Uh, another branch of psychology is called the psychometrics. You cannot be an effective teacher without psychometrics because you must be able to measure. You must be able to find out through tests, through, through exams, how much your students are performing, you know, so that they can be able to give you feedback. Will I repeat that lesson if they did not understand all? As a teacher, what am I going to do? Maybe my pace of teaching was very fast. Maybe I need to slow down. Maybe I am teaching too much content together. How can I split my content so that my students can be able to succeed? That is what is referred to as a, a psycho, a psychometric. Then in schools, we have people we refer to as school psychologists. Yeah, in those advanced schools, uh, they have people who are known as school psychologists, not necessarily school counselors, although sometimes they may work together. They are called school psychologists, and their work is to test and evaluate students. Their work is to analyze learning problems, and where possible, they usually counsel the teachers, and they also counsel the parents. They call, we call them uh, school psychologists, another branch that, is, uh, that has come up. We also have what we call the industrial and organizational psychologists, and they, they work, they are, they are concerned about, uh, it's a, this branch is about work setting, and environmental conditions of work. Like now we can see this university has really taken care of our 
of our environment. Uh, we have sanitizers, we have, uh, like, because of the disease now, we have uh, very many points of washing. Uh, the welfare of the student and the welfare of the teacher, the security, all that is about um, the working environment or the, the school environment, that it is as conducive uh, as possible. Then we have one of the latest branches, and uh, I can teach and forget to teach any other, but my dear students, I can never forget to teach about this one, which is called the psychology of women. It is one of the latest branches, and uh, I'm sorry to tell my my gentlemen uh, students, that there is none uh, at the moment for psychology of men. But Munapo Ederea Kusoma, maybe one of you will come up with it as you advance in your studies. And psychology about women, it's concerned about the role of women in the society. For a very long time, my dear students, women have um, been abandoned, I would say that. Women have been neglected, I would say that. Women have not been uh, really been concerned about. But now with this psychology of women, it's about empowering the woman that she possesses as equal abilities as a man. And helping our men to understand that sometimes we, we men behave sometimes based on influences of hormones. And that should not be a reason why a woman should be set apart. And they're also concerned about this discrimination against women. Issues to do with gender violence. Like if there is any one of you who watched the NTV news yesterday, there is an article that now that most uh, families are back at home, both husband and wife are back at home, the rate of uh, domestic violence, especially against women, has really, really gone high. So it's about empowering the woman and asking that the woman be recognized and be given a place uh, within, the, uh, within the society. Um, and uh, the last branch, uh, which now start our next lesson, is a branch now, we, uh, which is now called the education psychology. That now will be the focus of our unit. But for the purpose of, because also another branch of psychology, I would say that I have given this example and the diagram here. You can see now this is the teacher and this is the runner. And we are saying this is a branch of psychology that specializes in understanding, uh, uh, understanding teaching and learning in educational settings. That as educational psychologists, we are concerned about this learner in class. That every learner in my class is able to benefit from my teaching. That every learner in class feels accepted and wanted and part and part and parcel of the class. And I cannot be able to do that as a teacher if I do not have the knowledge or psychology. As a teacher, I have to apply psychology in class to be able to assist my student. When I see my student yearning, like now at around this time, is it really hunger or is the child bored? What is it? I try to apply the knowledge of psychology instead of being biased and talking ill of the student uh, and look at the welfare of this run. And that will be, that will mark the beginning of our next lesson. And therefore, before we meet next, my dear student, I want you to uh, read ahead of me. And that is the assignment I've given you, the focus of education psychology. What is it concerned about? Uh, uh, put yourself in groups, uh, discuss about this topic, and when we meet next, that is where we shall start uh, our lesson. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, we shall be able uh, to meet uh, during the next lesson. Um, uh, I'm grateful uh, for your time. These televised lectures supplement our robust online learning going on on our MKU online platform. You can view more on our televised lectures via our online platform. We are in a digital era and Mount Kenya University knows this. The following are the steps to follow so as to complete your online application. Download the application form from the website www.mku.ac.ke Attach copies of your academic certificates and ID. Pay the application fees via M-Pesa pay bill number 270988. Your ID is the account number. 2,000 shillings is the charge for a postgraduate. You can also deposit in the bank accounts provided on the website. Then email all the above to apply at mku.ac.ke.